Let's get started this afternoon. Okay, welcome everyone. I'm Jack Barth. I'm the Executive Director of the Marine Studies Initiative here at Oregon State. So welcome to this beautiful afternoon inside to hear some amazing things. So the Marine Studies Initiative is our effort on the OSU campus to pull together the marine natural sciences, social sciences, arts and humanities. And our mission is to create a healthy future for our ocean and the planet through transdisciplinary research and teaching that emphasizes collaboration, experiential learning, engagement with society, and problem solving. So it couldn't be more perfect that we have uh, Dr. Terry Hughes today to talk about such a topic and how we approach it from all those different angles. So Dr. Hughes is the director of the Australian Research Council Center of Excellence for Coral Reef Studies and distinguished professor at James Cook University in Australia. And we have joined by our two distinguished panelists, uh, Virginia Weiss and Dr. Rebecca Vega Thurber. We'll say a little bit more about them in a moment. So this should be a really interesting and engaging event. We've uh, laid out plenty of time, both for the presentations and engaging with you. We'll be looking at how coral reefs are changing and how they're reacting to different pressures. We'll see some of the problems, but we want to be thinking about solutions all along the way. Okay, so the format, Dr. Hughes will uh, present for about 45 minutes, then we'll give you a chance to do some uh, Q&A questions and answers with him. Then we'll take a little break at four. You can stand up and stretch, talk to your neighbor. Uh, others may join us. If you have to leave, that's fine. And then at 4.15, we'll start with our science panel up here with uh, Drs. Weiss and Vega Thurber. And then we'll end promptly at 5. I've been told we're going to end promptly. And then we'll go up into the room for a reception and some posters on topics that uh, students are working on across campus. So a couple quick thanks. I'd like to thank Bruce Mangi and Jane Lubchenco for hosting Dr. Hughes. I'd like to thank our co-sponsors, the Oregon Sea Grant, the Marine Studies Initiative, and the Wayne and Gladys Valley Foundation. And then to our local organizers, Virginia Nealon, Teresa Bolin, and Tara Blandich. And then our great student poster organizers, Jack Koch and Becca Mayer. And then you'll also see some students and staff with the bright aqua shirts on. I think Haley's got one in the, in the middle there. They're our great marine studies team that's helping out this afternoon. Okay, so a little bit about Dr. Hughes. In December 2016, he was recognized by Nature as one of the 10 people who mattered this year for his leadership in responding to the global coral bleaching event caused by climate change. Terry's research has enabled him to translate fundamental and innovative science into practical solutions that improve the management and governance of marine environments. Nature's 10 dubbed him a reef sentinel for the global role he plays in applying multidisciplinary science to securing reef sustainability. He's an Australian Research Council Laureate Fellow, was elected a Fellow of the Australian Academy of Science in 2001, and was a member of the Expert Advisory Committee for Australia's National Research Priorities in 2002. He's a fellow of the Bayer International Institute for Ecological Economics of the Royal Swedish Academy and a former member of the Board of Directors of the Resilience Alliance. He's been awarded numerous prizes, including the Centenary Medal of Australia, the Quadrennial Darwin Medal of the International Society for Coral Reef Studies. Dr. Hughes currently serves as the director, as I mentioned, of the Australian Research Council Center of Excellence for Coral Reef Studies. This center of excellence cements Australia's leading contribution to coral reef sciences and fosters stronger collaborative links between major partners and 24 leading institutions in nine countries. Collectively, they create the world's largest concentration of coral reef scientists. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Hughes and his talk about the Great Barrier Reef. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here on uh, a beautiful spring day, although I personally find it rather chilly. But um, then I'm from the tropics, 
So I'm going to talk today about uh, global warming and coral reefs. And to put you in the mood, I'll start off with this beautiful picture of, of a coral reef from somewhere in the Indo-Pacific Ocean. Now, most people will look at this picture and they'll probably go, wow, that's beautiful. The water is amazingly clear. You can see the diver up there for scale. But this picture tells a story, if you think about the natural history that's on display here. So the diversity of corals in this picture is actually quite low. Uh, many of them belong to this species of tabular or plating coral called Acropora hyacinthus, which is a very common coral right across the Pacific and Indian Oceans and into the Red Sea. There is also lots of small branching corals, also in the genus Acropora, here, here, and here. And there are other corals that look a bit like a big cauliflower in the genus uh, Postlepora. Those three types of corals dominate this picture. And if you look at these tables, most of them are about a meter in diameter. So there's not really a full spectrum of sizes. It's quite an even age distribution. And there are no corals in this picture that are more than 12 or 15 years old. There are no 50 or 100 year old corals. So my reading of this picture is that this is a reef which was seriously disturbed about a decade earlier than when this picture was taken. And since that time, it's been colonized by a relatively small subset of species, species that are characterized by breeding in large numbers, recruiting quickly and growing fast before the next disturbance event occurs. And that kind of dynamic, which I've just described, is unfolding worldwide in response to a change in the disturbance regimes that coral reefs are experiencing because the natural disturbance regime, which is dominated throughout most of the tropics by cyclones and hurricanes, is now being augmented by recurrent coral bleaching events due to anthropogenic global warming. And I'll talk in much more detail about that in a moment. So while this could actually be described as a somewhat degraded coral reef, it is still functioning as a coral reef. It still supports a vibrant tourism industry and the livelihoods of about 400 million people throughout the tropics depend on coral reefs for their food security and well-being. This is a picture of me in an airplane flying at 150 feet above sea level above the Great Barrier Reef in 2016 censusing the extent of coral bleaching, looking down from these flight paths along the length and breadth of the Great Barrier Reef at the phenomenon of bleaching. This is what it looked like from the air. So everything you can see here that's white or yellow is basically a dying coral. In the northern third of the Great Barrier Reef, in, at the peak of summer temperatures in March 2016. If you go underwater, you'll see the bleaching close up Underwater, you can, of course, do a lot more detailed research. You can identify the corals. So about 70% of these corals are bleached. This one is dying. It's been colonized by filamentous green algae. Most of the corals that are affected are these branching acropora corals or tabular table-shaped acroporas. There's another one dying. So about 70% of the corals on this reef were bleached at the time that this census was, was taken at the peak of summer temperatures in March 2016. So today I'm going to talk about four different uh, aspects of global warming. I'm going to talk about heat exposure as a driver of ecological change at the scale of the Great Barrier Reef and indeed throughout the tropics. I'll talk about the recent coral bleaching record from 1980 up to the present throughout the tropics. Then I'll talk in more detail about four episodes of bleaching that we've now documented on the Great Barrier Reef since 1998. And finally, I'll talk briefly about the prospects for recovery. By way of background, uh, let's talk about this graph, which shows through time from 1870 up to 2016, changes in, in temperature throughout the tropics. So I'm sure you're all familiar with the temperature anomaly graphs where, where temperature deviation from the historical average is plotted on this axis against time. They're usually shown as blue bars 
with uh, colder anomalies historically transitioning to taller and taller red bars of warmer anomalies in more recent decades due to global warming. This graph is a little bit different in that the data for this graph comes from one degree longitude by one degree latitude pixels throughout the tropics for pixels that contain coral reefs. And the different symbols represent the three phases of ENSO cycles. So La Nina parts of ENSO cycles, which are slightly warmer at a global scale, ENSO neutral periods, and La Ninas, which are slightly cooler. And the main point of the graph is that all three phases of ENSO cycles are warming to the extent that temperatures in the tropics today during cooler La Nina periods are actually warmer than they were during warmer El Nino periods just 30 or 40 years ago. So the color bands there are the 95% confidence limits around these fitted curves for El Nino and La Nina periods. The reason we're seeing more and more coral bleaching is that it no longer takes an El Nino to trigger a bleaching event. We're seeing bleaching events now throughout ENSO cycles, including during relatively cooler La Nina periods. It's just that the La Nina periods now are hotter than they used to be 30 years ago. So this is a map of the tropics. It has 100 data points on it. This is from a paper we published in Science in January last year. And of those 100 locations, 74 of them are colored red, meaning that they had more than 30% of the corals were bleached in the El Nino period of 2015-2016. So in the summer of 2015 in the northern hemisphere, these reefs bleached severely. And in the following summer in, in early 2016 in the southern hemisphere, we got bleaching uh, in, the, in the southern hemisphere. This was actually the third time since 1998 that more than 50% of the world's coral reefs experienced severe bleaching simultaneously. The first was in 1998, which was in the El Nino period. The second was in 2010, which was also a strong El Nino period. And the third was in 2015, 16. And again, it was a strong El Nino period. But we're seeing more and more bleaching events in every year. So this graph shows through time the 100 locations that I just showed you. And this is a sort of a depletion curve for severe bleaching and total bleaching, mild plus severe, for those 100 locations. So in 1980, none of them had yet bleached. And by the time we get up to 2016, all of them have bleached at least mildly. And 94 out of the 100 have bleached severely at least once since 1998. This crash here is a 1998 bleaching event, which was the first global event. These positive curves are the cumulative number of severe events. So 300 means, on average, each of those locations has bleached now three times. The Great Barrier Reef has just gone to four, so it's pretty close to average. There's a distribution around that, so the, the median number is three to four. As I said, uh, six of them are still zero, and many locations have bleached five, six, seven, eight, or even some have bleached nine times since 1998. So in the 1980s, when these mass bleaching events first were recorded, the average gap between one event and the next one was 25 years. Since 2010, the average gap has shrunk to only 5.9 years between one event and the next one. So over the course of my career, we've basically gone through three phases. When I was an undergraduate, mass bleaching events at the scale of, say, the Caribbean or the Eastern Pacific or the Western uh, Pacific were unheard of. Uh, the first large-scale bleaching event occurred in the El Nino year of 82-83. Uh, I first saw bleaching in the Caribbean in Jamaica in 87. Uh, 98 was a wake-up call for many people because it was the first time that many reefs in Australia uh, and in the Indian Ocean bleached. Uh, but now bleaching has become so routine that we actually have weather forecasts for them to help us predict whether an event is imminent or not. 
And here's an example of such a weather forecast. This is a map produced by NOAA. There are equivalent maps produced by the Australian Bureau of Meteorology, uh, by the Japanese, uh, by the French, and so on. This was a map issued in February 14, 2017, for the period February to May 2017 um, uh, by NOAA. And basically, red is bad. Red is a prediction that bleaching may occur. Leaching is a breakdown in the relationship between a coral host and its symbiotic microalgae that live inside its tissue or its zooxanthellae. When um, NOAA issues these forecasts, it accompanies them uh, with uh, some advice that says, if we go above four degree heating weeks, which is a measure of heat exposure that I'll explain in a moment, then bleaching is likely. And if we go above eight degree heating weeks, then mortality following bleaching is likely. So a degree heating week is a commonly used metric of heat exposure. It integrates both the height of a spike in temperature in degree centigrade above the normal long-standing summer maximum multiplied by the duration of that spike. So four degree heating weeks could be either one degree above the normal summer maximum that lasts for four weeks, or it could be two degrees above the normal summer maximum that lasts for two weeks. So it integrates both the extent of the heat, uh, the, the spike, uh, and its duration. I'll come back to those magic numbers of four and eight um, later on in, in the talk. So the Barrier Reef has now bleached four times. Uh, the first event was in 1998. It was El Nino, and so was 2016, but the other two events in 2002 and 2017 were during ENSO neutral conditions. So bleaching occurred anyway. So we no longer need an El Nino event to trigger dangerous levels of coral bleaching because the baseline temperature due to global warming is going up and up. We were somewhat unlucky to have only a four year gap between 98 and 2002. Uh, and then we were very lucky to have a 14 year gap between 2002 and 2016. And tragically, we've now experienced the first back to back bleaching event in two consecutive summers. And the climate modelers tell us that back to back bleaching could become the norm, happen every year under unrestrained uh, greenhouse gas emissions by about 2040 or, or 2050 in different parts of the tropics. We're very lucky in Australia to have some uh, amazingly detailed information from the first two events in 98 and 2002. This comes from a paper by a researcher called Ray Berkelman, who worked for the Australian Institute of Marine Science. And Ray had the initiative to get into a small plane and to map out the extent of coral bleaching at the scale of the Great Barrier Reef in both of those two early events. And he came up with this scheme of categorizing the extent, the severity of the bleaching by looking at the window of the airplane. So green is little or no bleaching, and orange and red are severe levels of bleaching. You can see that the footprint of bleaching in 98 was mostly coastal, whereas we saw more, degree, more levels of moderate and heavy bleaching further offshore in 2002, and in both of those events, there was little or no bleaching in the northern part of the Great Barrier Reef and in the southern offshore region down here. So following these first two events, many of us thought that maybe the northern Great Barrier Reef was a spatial refuge, one of those places where bleaching was less likely to occur. It's the most pristine, most remote part of the Great Barrier Reef. Very few people live or go there. Uh, there's no issue with water quality or runoff. Um, it, it really is a wild place. And we thought maybe, because it doesn't have any local stressors, that it is somehow immune to these recurrent bleaching events. Turns out we were wrong. So these are the flight paths that I flew uh, in a light plane and in this helicopter. That's a picture of me for scale um, in 2016 and unfortunately, again, a year later. And just to uh, explain the scale of this, 
Um, I've just driven from San Diego, let's say at San Diego, to Corvallis, which is about there, and Vancouver is up there, right? So it's 2,300 kilometers in extent. It's about 250 kilometers wide at its widest. So that little squiggle there, that loop, is an eight-hour flight in a 12-seater airplane. Um, so it takes um, eight pretty grueling days, including three days in this helicopter. We left the two doors behind in a sugarcane paddock. That was our air conditioning. Um, and we basically crisscrossed the reef and scored uh, every reef that we flew over the top of as to whether it was bleaching or not and to what extent. We also did an enormous amount of work underwater. Basically, we've put 100 divers underwater at all of these locations for the month of March in 2016. And the first task we did was to ground truth the accuracy of the aerial scores, which had not been done before. So these are our four aerial scores, and these is the amount of bleaching we measured underwater. Underwater, we can measure bleaching as a continuous variable from zero to 100%. So category three aerial score is 30 to 60% bleaching, and when we measured it underwater, it was smack in the middle of that range. So the main thing to take from that graph on the right is that the aerial scores were amazingly accurate. As I said, underwater we can do a lot more stuff. We can identify the coral species, we can measure their physiology, we can collect genetic samples, and we can go back later to see how the coral survived in the aftermath of the bleaching, and I'll talk about that in a, in a moment. So the top three maps show you the bleaching patterns in 98, 2002, and 2016. I've already shown you these two from Ray Berkelman's picture, paper, sorry. And this is the map that we produced from our more recent aerial survey. You can see that in 2016, the northern third of the Great Barrier Reef was very severely bleached. So 2016, was a much more severe event than either 2002 or 1998. And the reason for that is the temperatures were much higher and they lasted for longer. So the three maps on the bottom are the degree heating week, uh, heat exposure maps, which we produced from NOAA's uh, satellites. So the heat was mainly near shore and southern in 1998 in comparison to 2016, where the heat was extreme in the north more moderate in the middle, and it was cooler in the south. The reason it was cooler in the south is because a cyclone came along with wonderful uh, timing. It was uh, Cyclone Winston, which passed over Fiji on the 20th of February. It came to southern Queensland about 10 days later as a spent cyclone, so it didn't have much energy, but it did have a lot of cloud cover, and it brought the temperature down by about three degrees in the southern half of the Great Barrier Reef and basically rescued that part of the reef. Without that ex-cyclone, the whole reef would have been red. The main point I want you to take from this slide is that the spatial pattern of where the heat is matches very precisely the spatial pattern of where the bleaching has, has occurred. Underwater, we can measure the percent of the corals that are bleached as a continuous variable rather than a categorical variable, which we get from the aerial scores. So underwater at all of these reefs, we can compare the thermal exposure in degree heating weeks that each reef experienced against the amount of coral bleaching that we measured on each of those reefs. So this is the first of three response curves that I'll show you. The y-axis will change. This one is bleaching. The x-axis will be the same. It's heat exposure in, in each case. So this curve shows that the threshold for bleaching wasn't four degree heating weeks on the Great Barrier Reef in 2016. It was just two. And by the time we get to four degree heating weeks, we actually had about 45% bleaching on average. There's quite a lot of scatter from reef to reef around this fitted curve. And part of the reason for that is differences in the species composition of corals on each of these reefs. So a reef that had more heat susceptible corals, and I'll come back to that later, um, had a higher level of bleaching for a given level of degree heating week exposure, and the opposite occurred on reefs that had heat tolerant species. They had less bleaching 
for a given level of, of heat exposure. We went back to these same reefs, or to a subset of them, eight months later, to ask the question, after bleaching, who survived and who died? So this picture shows you the aftermath on a severely bleached reef in the northern part of the Great Barrier Reef. These are dead Acropora tables, and these are dead Acropora staghorn and branching corals. In the background here, you might be able to make out a brain coral. It's been burnt and lost a lot of tissue on the top of the coral, but just a live tissue around the sides. And in the background here, there's a smooth, slow-growing parietes coral. They're the toughest in terms of um, heat exposure. Um, they grow very slowly. They live for a couple of hundred years, and they're slow to bleach and even slower to die following bleaching. So we talk about so-called winners versus so-called losers. And the reason that's important is because global warming and bleaching events are changing the mix of coral species and changing the way that coral reefs function because these tabular and branching corals are really important as the providers of habitat. They make the nooks and crannies that fish and all the rest of the biodiversity depends on. These massive, slow-growing things don't do that. They're good at other things. They're good calcifiers. They're good at uh, growing a reef. Uh, so geologists love them. Um, but if you can see, I think, that if we change the mix of species from an assemblage dominated by these to dominated by those, the whole mix of functions um, changes um, in the reef. So we went back to these reefs here after eight months uh, at the end of 20. 16, and we measured the amount of mortality. So in the south where there was no heating, no bleaching, there was no mortality, so they're green. In the middle it was intermediate, and in the north we have lots of orange and red reefs where the mortality rate ranged from 50 to 75 percent of the corals, or even higher, 75 to 100. So from this point north here, the average mortality uh, on these reefs was 51 percent and across the whole Great Barrier Reef, including the southern bit, which didn't bleach, the average loss was 30%. We wanted to produce, no pun intended, a heat map of mortality. So to do that, we used our aerial scores to produce this calibration curve. So these are the aerial scores we had for 1,156 reefs, and we had aerial scores for all of these reefs. So we used this data to convert uh, the aerial scores into average mortality rates. So a, a reef that had category four bleaching, which is 60 to 100% bleaching, on average had about 70% mortality. And so we can convert all of our aerial scores to produce this map of mortality. I've already shown you the degree heating weak stress map. These two maps are calculated completely independently. This comes from satellite data and that comes from our aerial scores of bleaching and our underwater scores of mortality. And you can see they match each other, each other really well. In the south where it was cool, there was no mortality. In the middle it was intermediate, about 10% in this region. And in the north it was just over 50% mortality. So earlier I showed you the first of three calibration curves. It was bleaching versus degree heating weeks. This graph here has degree heating weeks on the x-axis again, but this is change in coral cover on the reefs that we surveyed twice before and after um, mortality occurred. So at low levels of heat exposure, there was little or no mortality. This is a log scale. As the degree heating weak exposure experienced by these individual reefs increase all the way up to 10, we see more and more mortality. And above about six, we saw catastrophic mortality of, of 70 to uh, 60 to 90 percent decline above above eight. Um, and I'll show you one more calibration curve in a moment. I want to talk now about the winners and losers um, issues. So as I've mentioned, three-dimensional staghorn and tabular corals like these one. This is a pile of rubble. Uh, staghorn corals are the uh, losers in that they have um, heavy rates of bleaching and high rates of post-bleaching mortality, whereas parietes, these old smooth things, 
I took this picture because it's unusual to have a Bryde's coral that's white. It did bleach, but it regained its color in the months um, afterwards. So in the coral bleaching literature, the normal narrative is that bleaching is not necessarily fatal. Um, the corals can regain their color, and if they regain their color by the regrowth of their zooxanthellae quickly enough, they'll be fine. But if they stay bleached for too long, then they'll slowly starve to death because they don't have the advantage of the photosynthate produced by the algae living inside their tissue. It turns out it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, Post-bleaching mortality is complex. Um, we were very surprised that half of the mortality we measured occurred within about a week of bleaching. Those corals did not die slowly of starvation. They died directly from heat stress. They cooked. They literally liquefied before our eyes. We also saw the highest level of disease in corals post-bleaching. And the per capita predation rate on the corals that survived the bleaching went through the roof because the predators were still there. But certainly in the north, where we saw 70, 80, 90 percent loss of corals. There were a lot more predators per coral after the bleaching than there were um, beforehand. So in the coral bleaching literature, there's lots of graphs that look like this, where you have a range of coral taxa along the x-axis and percent bleaching on this axis. This is not percent bleaching. This is percent mortality. So the ultimate losers are the corals that die. So we're looking here at mortality, not bleaching. And it's quite flat. One of the, it shows a spectrum of responses. So with the exception of these two at the end, most of these taxa suffered between 60 and 80% or so mortality. So this is data for the red reefs in the north that were severely bleached. And when, when bleaching is really severe, when nearly all of the corals bleach, you get high levels of mortality right across the spectrum. So the term winners and losers is a relative one, because even the, win even the winners, so-called, had relatively high levels of mortality following this really severe uh, bleaching event. This is the third calibration curve that I'm going to show you, sorry, response curve. So here again, we have degree heating week. This axis is the change in the mix of species. So those of you who are familiar with multivariate analyses of species composition, you may be familiar with tools like non-metric MDS or PCAs or CDAs. This, it's that kind of analysis where this is basically delta species composition plotted as a function of degree heating week exposure. So zero means the species composition was the, cha was the same at the time of the bleaching and eight months later. So these are southern reefs that had low levels of heat exposure, little or no bleaching, and they didn't change in their species composition. But once we got above six degree heating weeks, we saw a, a sudden shift in the slope of this relationship. And basically, these are reefs that had a catastrophic loss of Acropora and most other things. You could call this an ecological uh, transformation or even a collapse where these reefs have typically 70, 80, 90 percent loss of corals and a shift in the mix of species. And 29 percent of the 3,000 or so reefs that make up the Great Barrier Reef had a heat exposure of six or more degree heating weeks in 2016. Tragically, uh, just as these data were being published from our 2016 bleaching analyses, the reef bleached again. So I want to sum up most of what I've shown you so far with um, this slide, which shows the expanding geography of the four bleaching events that we've seen so far. So I'm basically going to superimpose our bleaching footprints on top of each other. So this was the first one in 98, mainly coastal, nothing much happening in the north. These maps I've simplified. I've left off the yellow and the green dots. So this is just the orange and red severe bleaching category. If we add to it the 2002 event, we see more offshore bleaching. This was a point in history where we thought that maybe the north was, had something special going for it until it was absolutely blitzed. 
in 2016. So I think this gives you an idea of just how severe 2016 was in comparison to the first two events. 2017 is actually quite hard to see. You'll see a bit more red dots here. So that's adding 2017. 2017 is hard to see because at this point, 93% of the reefs comprising the Great Barrier Reef have bleached to some extent at least once. And 61% of them have bleached severely, these orange or uh, red categories, at least once since 1998. And many of them have bleached two, three, and some of them four times in those four events. Moving now to the 2017 event. So I've shown you this map of where the bleaching occurred in the third event in the north. In 2017, most of the bleaching occurred in the central region of the Great Barrier Reef, meaning that the footprint of severe bleaching in both of these two years combined extends from the northern Great Barrier Reef down to here. That's a distance of 1,500 kilometers, roughly 1,000 miles of reef where about half of the corals, um, slightly more, has died in these um, two events. This is the first back-to-back -back bleaching event that we've seen, and it's given us the opportunity to ask the question whether the experience of the corals in year one, in 2016, made any difference to the outcome to heat exposure uh, a year later in 2017. And so what we're getting at here is the idea of ecological memory, which is a concept that's scattered throughout the ecological literature, primarily in reference to recurrence of fire in terrestrial ecosystems. And, and so our premise was that as the gap between recurrent bleaching events shrinks, we no longer have the luxury of treating them as single independent events because they're starting to become interactive. And I'll show you that now. So this map here is the difference in degree heating week exposure between 2016 and 2017. Blue means it was cooler in 2017. So these shades of, of orange indicate that for about 90% of the Great Barrier Reef, year two was hotter again than year one, but we actually saw less bleaching in 2017 compared to 2016. And if we look at our bleaching response curve, so this is the probability of bleaching in each year against degree heating week exposure. I've shown you that response curve earlier for year one. The response curve in year two moved way to the right. It took a lot more heat in year two to generate the same level of bleaching uh, compared to year one. And there are a couple of reasons um, why that occurred. The primary one relates to what happened in the north. Um, in year one in the north, most of the heat susceptible corals were killed off, basically. So dead corals don't bleach a second time. So part of the reason that the uh, assemblages were more robust in year two is that we have proportionally more winners and a lot fewer losers um, compared to year one. But something interesting also happened in the south. The south had about 10% bleaching in year one and had no bleaching in year two, despite it being on average two degree heating weeks warmer in the south in year two. It should have bleached. And if they had followed the response curve of 2016 a year later, then we should have seen 10, 20% bleaching in the south, but we saw none. So it appears that the experience of those southern corals in year one somehow has toughened them up. And I'm hoping the panel discussants following me can uh, shed some light on the sorts of mechanisms which um, might allow that sort of acclimation or adaptation to unfold, but it's really intriguing. So to sum all that up, the impact of the second heat wave in 2017 and where it occurred was contingent on the experience that the reef had a year earlier, which underscores the need to understand the strengthening interactions between sequences of events. We no longer have the luxury of studying these as one-off independent events because they're interactive with each other. And coral reef resilience is increasingly challenged by the frequency of these events. So you may be familiar with the IPCC report that came out 
a couple of months ago from South Korea, which projected that one and a half degrees of global average warming would kill, I think it was 77% of the world's coral reefs and two degrees would kill 99%. I think those are uh, too pessimistic estimates because they are assuming uh, that the impact of future bleaching events will be the same as the impact of current bleaching events. And our data shows that that's not necessarily the case. We got a different result in 2017 than in 2015. I'll finish up with our latest study, which was published in Nature just after I arrived in, in the US um, two weeks ago. Um, this relates to the recoverability of the Great Barrier Reef in the aftermath of the two bleaching events. So the, cover, the picture on the left shows a settlement panel which we deploy along the length of the Great Barrier Reef, surrounded by adult broodstock. These are the adults that make the babies that stay in the water column for a few days before settling on a panel. And this is a, a similar picture from our more, more recent deployment, which we did in 2018 after the two bleaching events. But this time, there's not much broodstock producing the babies surrounding that, that panel. When corals reproduce, they do so in one of two ways, depending on the species. They can either be brooders or spawners. Brooders um, produce a well-developed larva that's fertilized internally. They release a planulae, which goes splat which is a technical term for short larval duration. They typically settle uh, within 12 to 24 hours. So at the scale of an individual reef, one of the 3,000 reefs making up the Great Barrier Reef, uh, brooded corals are s mostly self-seeding. So their interconnections are very short. Spawning corals, on the other hand, chuck out eggs and sperm. They fertilize externally. They're not capable of settling before four to seven days. So they travel a lot further, typically several 10 to maybe 200 kilometers. So their connections are much longer from where they're produced to where they settle uh, on a reef. Historically, when we put out these panels, we get about 50 recruits after eight weeks, and 80 or 90 percent of them typically are spawners. The rest are brooders. So this is the result that we've just published. The map of the barrier reef on the left shows data for 47 reefs where we've measured recruitment from the north to the south um, uh, over a, a distance of 2,300 kilometers. This is logistically very difficult to do. We need five boats with teams of researchers. And on the 10th day before the annual mass spawning, we put down 1,000 panels. Each of those boats are roughly 300 miles apart. and we put them down on the 10th day before the annual spawning, plus or minus one day, so a three-day window. And then eight weeks later, we collect them with a three-week window from all of these locations. So the diameter of these circles indicates the density on the average density per panel. And the blue segment is the proportion of corals that are brooded. And as you can see, they're the dominant coral historically is the yellow one, which is the spawners, mostly spawning acroporus. When we did this again with 1,000 panels on 17 reefs in 2018, we found that the average recruitment had declined by 89%. Um, for spawning acropora, the average decline was 93%. Uh, and the proportion of brooders uh, has increased. So for the first time uh, that we've ever measured it, um, brooding uh, baby corals dominate the pool of new recruits, um, whereas historically it has always been spawning acropora. So, who's that? so to conclude, recurrent bleaching is the new norm. It's happening now in most places every five years or less. Um, I've shown you unprecedented mortality on the upper two-thirds northern and central section of the Great Barrier Reef. The recovery time for the fastest growing corals, for that beautiful picture I showed you at the beginning, is about a decade. That's fairly optimistic. Uh, and obviously, it takes much longer for slow growing corals. You can't kill off a 50-year-old coral and replace it in 10 years. It takes 50 years. 
and we no longer have 50 years between one bleaching event and the next. And that's why I'm saying the species composition of the northern and central Great Barrier Reef is not going to return to what it used to be just three years ago. But before you all go outside and slit both wrists, <laughs> um, we now have a glass half full, glass half empty. 50% of the corals died on the Great Barrier Reef, roughly. 50% are still alive and they number in the billions and they are still reproducing. We had 11% of the historical recruitment this year. That's 11% of trillions of larvae. So reproduction is still happening, but certainly the capacity of the reef to recover um, has changed. So I think I'm often asked the question whether or not we'll have a Great Barrier Reef in 50 years time. And my answer is an optimistic yes, I think so. But it's entirely contingent on reaching the Paris Agreement one and a half degree uh, target. Uh, because if we go much above two, then reefs will become more and more degraded, the hotter the world uh, becomes. And I wrote a paper about that which I haven't got time to go into. It's a review paper in Nature, and most of the authors <laughs> who join me on this paper are actually social scientists. So the coral reef crisis, so-called, is a crisis of governance, and what we need to fix is governance of climate change, and we now have a Paris framework, governance of fisheries, governance of water quality. So a lot of this paper is about changing institutions, policy frameworks, social norms and human behavior. It's not just about growing corals, which is a, a major emphasis in a lot of coral restoration projects. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. We uh, entertain a few questions for Dr. Hughes. Maybe if we could bring the lights up a little bit. on this big, uh, keep the ocean f uh, a, a degree and a half uh, cooler, that that should help significantly even in the southern hemisphere from the equator south where most of the coral is. Because even if it's colder in the northern part of the northern part of the earth, that those extra degrees will help to the southern hemisphere. Okay, there's quite a lot of issues there. Um, the one and a half and two degrees centigrade Paris targets are for global average temperature. So the global average temperature is something like 14, 15 degrees centigrade. It's not a particularly useful number if you work in the tropics where the water temperature is 29 or, or 30. Um, and of that one and a half degree of global average warming, we've already seen one, right? So we're talking about a further 0.5 degrees centigrade of warming average ac across the whole surface of the globe. The land is warming faster than the sea, and the tropics is warming more slowly than the subtropics and, and water at, at higher latitudes. So the northern Great Barrier Reef so far has warmed by about 0.4 degrees, and under the one and a half degree target, it will warm by about the same again by uh, the end of this century. Right. So we're dealing, the, if you look at the projected uh, tropical ocean temperatures, there are contours to it. It's not uniform. There are places that will warm more and places that will warm less. But the average is about 0.45 degrees centigrade of further warming above the amount we've already seen in the last 40 or 50 years um, under a one and a half degree global average warming target, right? And I think that's doable. That's me being optimistic. Me being pessimistic says, look at the damage that one degree of global average warming has already caused. So one and a half degrees won't be comfortable for coral reefs. It will change them further than the amount that they have already changed. So one of the things that has surprised us about all of this is the speed of change. The mix of corals in the Great Barrier Reef has changed now forever. It's not going to go back to what it was before 2016. And it's not going to stay the same as it is now. Um, so the change in the mix of baby corals is one filter going forward. What they grow up to be will be different from what resulted from the historical pool. So
So there's two filters going on. One is a filter going down, that's the winners versus losers. So the Parites will be there in greater proportion on future reefs um, than Acropora, unless of course Acropora bounces back quicker um, than Parites does, which is also true. So we're not quite sure what the final mix of species will be, but it's not gonna be what it is today and it's certainly not gonna be what it was 30 years ago. So throughout the tropics, this sort of transition in the mix of species has been happening now for a couple of decades. In places like Morea, where I know some of you work, um, the diversity has declined because Acropora are now much rarer than they were in the 1970s when they were, were described by French researchers. Today, those reefs are dominated by Poslopora. Um, and that's because Poslopora gets in fast, it's a good reproducer, and it recolonizes damaged reefs. So we'll still have reefs in the future, I think, if the heating doesn't become extreme, but the species composition will change further than it already has in the last few years and decades. Um, so how, how easy is it for coral populations or ecologies to establish at latitudes where there are no existing reef structures to recolonize? Yeah. Can, can they shift in a time frame of global warming? Yes, so we know from the fossil record that corals expand and contract um, in response to ice age, ice ages. So as we speak now, um, tropical species are on the march. So there's a growing literature on the tropicalization of subtropical regions as range boundaries of species expand north and south. So Caribbean species are making their way up to the Carolinas. Species are going along the Ryukas chain toward mainland Japan. On both cases, coasts of Australia, species are expanding south in response to warming temperatures. We're now seeing tropical fish over winter in Sydney Harbour for the first time. The spread of reefs, though, is a much longer phenomenon, so that's a geological process. So you need a thousand years to start to grow a reef and six for it to grow to sea level. Um, that, that's not happening. Um, but individual species are expanding and they're colonizing hard substrates rather than carbonate rocks. I'd like to follow up on that because um, we know that uh, a thousand years ago we were in the medieval warming period and we know that global temperatures were ab about the same as they are now. And we also know that after that the global temperature cooled gradually until it reached a minimum about 1850, which we call the Little Ice Age. And now it started rising after 1850 and now it's going up very fast. Um, could you uh, comment on whether it's possible that what we are seeing right now is a return to what it would be the more normal situation for coral over say the first 500 years of the last millennium and that the thing we're seeing now is the result of 150 years of quite cool temperatures 1700 to 1850. So that what we're seeing is a rebound to what you might call the normal condition of the first 500 years of this millennium. Yeah, the, the temperature trajectory you've just described is not a global one, and it certainly didn't occur in the tropics. Um, so I, I, I don't basically agree with the premise of your question. Um, Certainly for 50% of the corals on the world's largest coral reef ecosystem to die in two consecutive summers is hardly a sustainable uh, disturbance regime. So we've now seen four of these bleaching events since uh, 1998. Um, there's no evidence that mass bleaching has occurred in the past. And we, we know that for at least several centuries from the growth rings in massive corals. So if you, if you sample a population of massive corals and look at their growth history, almost like uh, tree rings, annual bands, um, you can find in places like Belize a synchronous distortion of those growth bands in 1998 due to a, a mass bleaching event. Um, 
which match matches the temperature record for that El Nino period. If you go backwards in time for that, um, uh, up to 200 years, there's no evidence for any earlier bleaching events before that period. Not with not with that proxy, but there are other proxies. Um, so the I mean the the medieval period you describe is basically a European record. It's not a, it's not a tropical record. Um, on the topic of the me memory, the year one and year two heating, I was curious, uh, do you think we should be focusing more of our efforts on studying the resilience versus like over recovery of corals? Does that make sense? I'm not sure what you mean by resilience versus over, um, what's I an guess over recovery? Like, the resi like studying more how on how corals uh, have the memory, look, you were you're saying before, have the memory of uh, not, of the memory of the past year in 2016, yeah. and then not he bleaching as much in 2017. Should we be fo focusing more on why that happens versus like coral farming or like trying to, after like a bleaching event, like, yeah. does okay. that make sense? So, <laughs> yeah, no, it makes sense. The, the reason we redeployed our recruitment panels is we've now moved on from describing and understanding why the bleaching occurred, where and who won and who lost, to looking at recoverability, or the resilience, if you like, mm -hmm. of, of the reef. Um, so we know, we know that it still has some capacity to rebound, um, but we're, there's a lot of uncertainty as to what it will rebound to mm -hmm. and how long that will take. It will take longer than it has historically because the rate of replenishment of baby corals is, is only a small fraction of what it used to be. So we're predicting that it will take at least five to 10 years before the adult broodstock recovers enough to have the same level of production of baby corals. And then another 10 years after that, before those baby corals mature into reproductive adult corals of the faster growing species. So that's the sort of trajectory that we're looking at. You've mentioned coral restoration. So there is some work being done in Australia and almost everywhere else throughout the tropics on replanting corals. Um, you can do that. It's very expensive and it's very time consuming. So when you're swimming with corals, you've got one in that hand and another in this hand. Um, on average, a hectare of coral reef has about half a million corals bigger than that. Um, so go you know, do the calculation. Um, it costs about $2 million per hectare to restore that area of reef with one or two species of corals. Mostly people pick branching fragments that are among the first to recolonize and they're the, they're the fastest to recover in, in any case. Um, we lost about 2,000 square kilometers of coral tissue on the Great Barrier Reef in 2016 and 2017. So at $2 million per hectare, that's um, four trillion dollars to regrow them. Um, so it's, it's, it's not a cost effective way forward. Um, the best thing we can do to ensure a resilient future for the world's coral reefs is to deal with greenhouse gas emissions. Your perspectives on this issue. One of the other complications for coral reef recovery is the issue of acidification. So can you speak to how the pH signature has overlaid some of these bleaching events and what that may pose for challenges moving forward? Yeah, a oh, good question. The, there are four different elements to climate change that are affecting reefs. The primary one in terms of the, it being contemporary, uh, actually having a history now of, of a few decades, is global heating. Right, and that was obviously the emphasis on my talk. Um, another set of issues are, uh, is around extremes in climate, so flood events, um, cyclones, hurricanes, and there's some evidence from some parts of the world that the intensity and frequency of those is going up. In other parts of the world, there's evidence that it isn't. Um, 
A third one is sea level rise. Sea level rise is not an issue for reefs, it's an issue for coastal real estate and insurance companies. Um, uh, corals dealt with a 140 meter rise in sea level at the end of the last ice age and they managed perfectly fine. So in the scheme of things, it's not important. And the final issue which you've raised um, uh, is ocean acidification. I think ocean acidification is an end of century problem under business as usual emissions for coral reefs. Um, it's much more immediate at higher latitudes. So in the tropics at the uh, concentration, the aragonite state is three or four times saturation. That's a pretty big buffer. And long before ocean acidification starts to kill corals, they'll cook under business as usual emissions, right? So most of the ocean acidification experiments that are published use PCO2 values of 1,000 or 2,000 or higher. Those are pretty extreme. They would correspond to a global average temperature rise of four to six degrees centigrade. Um, I don't think we'll ever get there because it'll be so uncomfortable for human societies that we'll finally get our act together and, and deal with it. Okay, uh, one last question. Um, I'm last okay, I'm from Alaska. Everybody smells it in the glaciers. All these things, you know, we know how old they are melting yep. very rapidly. So the oceans are supposedly rising, but it's somewhat teary in our history. Do these continents rise until they float around? Or could they float around again? But if they could float around again and not be sunk with rising water, could it be like new sources of food around floating islands? Like in our history, some said it might have been that way one time. Yeah, no, um, so we talked about global average temperature uh, earlier. The tropics are warming a, l a lot less than the poles, right? So the, the most dramatic temperature rises are in places like Alaska or, the, or in Antarctica, right? They're seeing already up to six degrees of, of warming compared to less than one degree of warming on, on land in, in the tropics. Um, you mentioned glaciers. Glaciers, many glaciers around the world, as well as coral reefs, are World Heritage areas. And they're uh, listed by UNESCO as being amazing places because of their heritage value. And UNESCO is very concerned that the reason why places like the Great Barrier Reef were listed, their biodiversity, their aesthetic value, uh, the the uh, number of branching corals, uh, the geological features, all of those are under threat, as indeed are glaciers, and many of them are World Heritage Areas. So UNESCO is finally starting to grapple with the issue of global warming, climate change more generally, and World Heritage listed areas. And they recently put out a statement where they promised that they would consider linking the policies of individual countries who are the stewards of individual World Heritage properties, they would link their policies on climate change to their responsibilities for looking after World Heritage areas, which has made the Australian government incredibly uncomfortable. <laughs> I, I know that didn't answer your question, um, but there was a lot to it. So. Great, let's, let's uh, take a break now. Let's take Dr. Hughes again. Thank you.